you see a terrifying ice bear with a strange compartment in its belly. The door is covered in frost and the bear's eyes are glowing red. The bear looks oddly realistic. Is it taxidermy? The lieutenant doesn't answer. His eyes are glued to the animal. A sharp slice of light shines out from its mysterious belly door. A gust of freezing cold air rushes to greet you. You hear a low grumble as the bear regulates itself. This is the inside of a refrigerator. The lieutenant takes a peek inside. His hand has found the holster of his gun. Of course, just a giant ice bear shaped fridge. Let's take a look inside. The shelves are empty. All you see are crumpled ice cream wrappers with the brand name Revachol Ice City. A handwritten note has been attached to the door. The fridge is huge. A friendly cartoon bear smiles back at you from a glossy cellophane wrapper. It looks nothing like the fridge. The paper still smells of vanilla and chocolate. Good question. It looks like an ice cream fridge. I know. What an unfortunate marketing choice. What is even worse, the bear is still costing them money to this day. The fridge buzzes with energy. The electricity bill on this thing must be catastrophic. You pocket the note and the little fridge magnets keeping it on the door. are plugged into the breaker box. The red one leads to the ice bear fridge and the black one to the ice cream maker nearby. An electric sizzle. The room is slightly quieter now. Something close to you dies with a soft electric purr. Why did you do that? The lieutenant raises his brows but doesn't say anything. The electric distribution board now has one cable missing. the furnace, coloring it pitch black. Looks like it. Looks like an old central furnace used to heat the building. It's connected to the chimney. No one has used it in ages. No signs of any recent fire. Only dead rats. A lush layer of coal now covers your skin, sinking into the wrinkles. Your hands look ancient. Maybe you could paint something with this coal. Leave a cave painting for future archaeologists. No, that would be stupid. It's dark and grimy here. In the darkness you can hear chatter. It's coming from above. A voice or several voices talking to each other. Near the smoke chamber, upstairs, the echo is so prominent, it's impossible to discern what the voices are saying or what's producing them. What are you doing?
Wait, really? Take your head out of the chimney, please. It's not safe. You're right. The rooms do look like they're connected. But malignant entities don't exist. At least not the supernatural kind. Always has to be the skeptic, this man. Something breaks loose in you. A mighty bellow echoes throughout the chimney's depths. The chatter of tiny voices above suddenly cease. Then... Hello? Hello? Did you say anything? I can't hear you. Please come upstairs. There's a safety curtain on the second floor. I'll open it. You hear a low rumble upstairs. The sound of a curtain being pulled aside. After you, officer. Hello, I'm Nia. Did you try knocking on my window? I must have missed you. I've been listening to my Milius. So what kind of dye are you looking for? She's got a direct view to the backyard. You should interrogate her about the lynching. Yes, Amelia is like a call-in station. You need a two-way radio to access one. That's why I have these. Mostly, they just teach you to swear in different languages. But some of the stations can be quite interesting. I was so absorbed, I must have missed you knocking. I'm a novelty dice maker. Tell me the name of your role-playing system and I'll make the die you need. That's why you're here, yes? Role-playing games? You know the one made by Fortress Accident. Does that count? Very good. My rate is 10 real per set. Unless you want something really unusual. Take a look around and see if there is any particular stone you want to use. It almost looks as if the stones and dice are a natural part of the room, growing out of the shells like stalagmites. No falsehoods are present. She's a novelty dice maker and doesn't have anything to hide. Ask what you need. How did I become one? It was a business decision. I was a regular jeweler at first, but that's an unfocused field with too much competition. Some of my friends were role players. They asked me to make some polyhedral dice out of cobalt. That was my first order. I grew it from there. Not especially. I like working with rare materials and a steady pay. And role players as customers? They're nice people. Some of those nice people have big bucks to spend on novelty items. Nothing really. I didn't know him. The lieutenant looks at his notebook, then the woman under the large window. Your window looks directly onto the courtyard. You're saying you didn't see or hear anything unusual last Sunday evening? I'm sorry, detective, but as you know, I usually have my headphones on when I'm working. It shuts out most of the daily ruckus behind my window. Well, there's always something going on in the whirling's backyard. During daytime, there are usually those kids. And lately, I've been seeing a lot of drunk workers hanging about. Must be because of the strike. She's heard of the murder, but did not see it, sire. But I never saw anyone during that fateful Sunday night, I'm afraid. I might have, but in this case, all I would have seen is my own reflection staring back from the darkness. It's light here but dark in the yard at night. It's really hard to make anything out in the yard when it's dark outside. Besides, I rarely get up to look out the window when I'm in the zone. It's an odd profession, 
making dice for people, but I like it, and I prefer doing this to sitting at home. She nods. Anything else, officer? We're inside the chimney of an old central furnace. It's strange, I know. But when I arrived here, all the other rooms were taken, so I had to build myself a makeshift home. Besides, I don't really have to pay any rent here, so that's a plus. Great here. When she arrived here, there was no room anywhere else. She must have known the other businesses. I've heard the stories, but I don't think those stories are true. Play sounds, the bookshop lady? I've heard that her business is doing rather well. Have the energy spared her somehow? All right, but it's not just the bookstore that's still up and running. What about the whirling in racks? Some people say it's part of the building complex. You could say so. Both houses were built at the same time and under the east of the Commerce Centre project. And then there is me. I've been here for 14 years, selling novelty dice to role-playing enthusiasts. Not exactly a million real business idea, yet somehow I've survived despite the talk of malicious energies. Strange, isn't it? Maybe it's just because she's so talented that she's been able to woo the curse. I was just about to ask, what do you think? Do you think the curse is real? <laughs> so I'm the Grand Dragon in the cave. Might I ask what supports this claim? Oh my, I've revealed myself. You better call the exorcists. Of course, how convenient. Well, if you ever find a way to explain all those inconsistencies in the curse, then let me know. That's all she has to say on the subject. She has been thorough and truthful, as far as we can see. Plaisance needs to hear about this. Perhaps if you combine your psychic energies, you will make sense of the situation. More or less, are you interested in anyone specific? Oh. Quite a lot of them spring to mind. Yes, I think it was called Androgynous Orlando or something similar. They weren't a big hit around here. Turns out that working class men don't like genderless haircuts. They're scared of that word. A bit of experimenting every now and then isn't bad. It's not about the haircut. It's about the confidence. I guess it just wasn't the time yet. It wasn't merely a gym, it was Artemiteps Boxing Club, a community project created to steer at risk use away from drugs and crime. Hmm, Kuno, who's Kuno? Oh, you mean the kid with the sailor's mouth? Yes. I've heard him yelling profanities in the backyard. I think it would take more than a gym to help that kid. A kind man, from Zemsk. I heard he had some trouble with the law when he was younger, and that's why he wanted to start the gym, as his way of giving back. It didn't. If anything, it made the youth situation in Martinez even worse. At some point, someone started a rumor that the punching bag downstairs was full of amphetamines. It's not really full of that. No one would store their drugs like that. Eventually, the coalition took away the funding and the club went bankrupt. This was a few years ago. It's gotten much more peaceful around the plaza ever since. Oh, this one's a mess. 
there used to be a company that promised to repair windows 24 hours a day. What could go wrong with this one, right? Turns out, the business was actually set up as a front for an illicit group that was producing snuff medias. Who would have guessed? Hmm, what's the snuff media? And they never cleaned up the debris either. Now it's just littering the hallway and I have no idea how to get rid of it on my own. It's a Sub Rosa radio station that broadcasts real murders with real victims. Some people pay good money to get off on it. Nothing changes in her tone as she says that, as if it's just another piece of information to lay out for the world. Don't worry, the ICP has a separate division that deals exclusively with unlicensed Sub Roses. This isn't our problem. Good luck with that. It's not easy catching those perpetrators. You mean Mr. Fabron, the taxidermist? No, he mostly just did drugs. Anything else? There used to be a fashion atelier here, but I have forgotten the head designer's name. They were doing well for a couple of years, until the insect rights activists came. Yeah, the atelier didn't know it either. They produced a certain collection that used chitin among the materials. Apparently chitin is made in the occident, where it's extracted from beetle wings. And you know how all kinds of political movements are big in the occident. The activists shut down the biggest chitin supplier, which of course caused the price to skyrocket. And, naturally, all the most fashionable tastemakers refused to be seen in chitin from then on. The atelier went bankrupt before they could finish the collection. Hmm, really? Anyway. They were made by a company called Slipstream. After they pivoted from making rotor blades to skis, their chef executive took off on a vacation with all their money. Honestly, I think it's quite funny. I think he's still sending out holiday transmissions from Tulula or Tiumotiri or Hashtkor or wherever he is. The usual, I imagine. But he's been thinking up all kinds of new business plans and can't wait to get started on them just as soon as he returns. Men like that are a curse. Sure. But Slipstream is history now. All their remaining assets got seized by the bailiffs in 47. I have no idea why those skis and blades are still lying around in the house. Not much use now, I guess. They were just the props. Why return them? Maybe you could make a sword out of one. No. Wait. Forget it. It would take too long. Fortress Accident, the radio game studio. They were an interesting bunch. We talked about role-playing systems every now and then. Once, I even saw two of them get into fisticuffs over Wiro. That's understandable. Fantasies are serious things. The mind is the drawing board of history. They certainly took their work very seriously, even if they seemed to be chronically liberal with their schedules. The usual. They ran out of money and couldn't get the project done on time. Well, I did hear them talking at times. They seemed to believe they were historical individuals on some grand quest. She sounds almost mocking when she says that. Yes, but when the money started to run out, they just began to complain a lot about capitalism. You know, how the markets are rigged to keep out new businesses and so on. In the end, they just didn't get it done. They didn't have enough willpower to produce something truly historic and to show up to work on time. Not the wiser decision. You would have lost all your savings. The result is one on a 20-sided die. Anything else? 